every single fiat currency has eventually collapsed. Normies who don't care about the technical stuff are not going to come in until they have a seamless user experience and it's pleasant and easy to transact and use bitcoins. I've been in finance for 20 years and I understood nothing about money. I do look at it as a time chain. It's somewhere where you can record history in a way that it can't ever be erased. There's a shift anyway away from the current payment networks, which don't really work very well at all and are centrally controlled and become very political to a system that is completely apolitical that anybody can join where anybody can transact. So I think that the Lightning Network is going to be really important. You don't have to go through all the faff of putting in your credit card, your name, your address. Now all that stuff's on a database and it's a honeypot for someone to steal and appropriate your identity. No, you just do a Lightning payment, bam, done. Trade should just be free. Taxation shouldn't happen. If you're doing business with people, you shouldn't be taxed on it. I'm happy to pay for things like roads and sewer networks and things like that. Governments should be service providers. I just noticed that governments are becoming increasingly less relevant as a benefit, like they're providing no benefit and they're actually causing more problems than they're, they're solving. You might not care about politics, but politics cares about you. I encourage people maybe to consider Bitcoin as the second coming. I ascribe a lot to the theory that we're living in a simulation. So I think Bitcoin might be something that has been put into our matrix to fix a program that is going wrong. You told me in the in the preparation you have an unpopular opinion about about Bitcoin being too technical. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what 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 could there be unpopular? Uh, what is what is that? Yeah, well, uh It's, it's not so much about Bitcoin. Well, it is about Bitcoin being too technical, but okay. So the unpopular opinion is, um, I think men are very good at building things. Like, you know, they're very good at kind of thinking about the engineering side of things and making something actually work. I don't think they're very good about the aesthetics um, or the user experience. And so my observation, I'm, I'm class of 2021 for Bitcoin. So my observation coming into this space was that, you know, the wallets and all of this kind of stuff, I mean, On paper, they work, like they do what they say they're going to do, but they're absolutely horrible to use. And so I think women tend not to be builders. And this is obviously like an app, a sweeping statement. There are exceptions that prove that rule. Some women are builders and some women are coders and engineers, but typically they're not drawn to those kind of subjects as much. Um, but I think what women are really good at is making a space or an experience uh, pleasant You know, so that could be a living space. It could be like UX of an app on your phone. It could be, you know, I don't know, events, things like that. So I think women are very good generally at like creating a very pleasant experience and ambience and mood or whatever. Um, and so I think the reason that we don't see a lot of women in Bitcoin in part is because the UX is so terrible. So they come in and they start wanting to look at the tools and using them. And they just find that the experience is horrible and they don't have time. They can't be bothered. They just get frustrated. And I think a man, again, very generalizing here, but responds to that differently. So a man might look at it and be like, this is a problem I have to solve. It's a challenge. I need to go fix this. Um, and I think that that's part of the reason why we don't see as much of that. And also why we don't see as much mass adoption, to be honest. I think normies who don't care about the technical stuff are not going to come in until they have a seamless user experience and it's pleasant and easy to transact and use Bitcoin. So that's my unpopular opinion. <laughs> I, think, I think it's not very, I think it's just like a factual opinion. <laughs> it's, 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 very, it's, very, it's very, very true in my opinion. Um, it's interesting. I think uh, I have an interesting uh, comparison with that. I lived single for like one and a half years in Munich uh, and people came to my apartment like one year after I moved in and like, oh, you just moved in, right? No, no, like I'm already one year living here uh, because I had just my bare essentials. Like I had a kitchen, I had a bath, uh, obviously, uh, and then I had a bed, a couch and a, and a desk. That's it. No plants, no pictures, nothing fancy, no, no living room. And now... Uh, I, I'm in a living relationship and I, I love it so much. And my apartment actually looks like someone living here. Like it looks actually like it, it's a good place to hang out. It's a good place to live. So, so I think those two pictures of my apartments then and now, I think that's the perfect definition of a single man <laughs> a household and someone uh, living in a relationship where someone actually cares about if there's a plant or if there is the bed in that yeah. corner or that corner. So like that makes a huge difference. And 
I don't care about it, but I love it more when it's uh, nice and when it feels good and when the environment is good, but I'm too lazy to do it. So I think that's a great uh, comparison to what you just said, because Bitcoin, uh, man, like completely uh, generalizing here, but uh, men are like, oh, it should work. It like the, the Bitcoin should go from A to B, but oh yeah, the user experience would also be nice. There should be some M animation there and stuff like that. And do we need that that female energy more in the in the Bitcoin space? Um, I think for mass adoption, yes. I mean, do you know Michelle Weekly? Um, she's a, an American girl that's in the Bitcoin space. Yeah, but she, she made she a was comment. On my podcast. Oh, she was. Oh, she's amazing. But I quote her a lot because she she put this post up on Twitter, and this was way before I knew her. Um, I think she said, we don't need more women in Bitcoin. We need more women with Bitcoin. Um, and I would tend to agree in the sense that I think actually holding it and understanding it is the most important thing. Like, it doesn't really matter if, I don't know, I mean, all this stuff of like seeing yourself represented, like whatever, you know, I, d I don't know that that really matters that much. But I do think that because we don't have more women in the space, the mass adoption is harder um, because we're not really meeting a wider segment of people's needs. And I don't mean just meeting women's needs. I think we're also not meeting many men's needs either. So they're very technical men that are very interested in like the engineering stuff and they're interested in the philosophy and they're quite disagreeable. You know, they're really drawn to the space. But, you know, the other guys that maybe not that way are not so much. So... I think for mass adoption, we do need to get more women in the space and get them more active and actually contributing to building things and running companies and, you know, just being a bit more prominent. Yeah, and I think that more women in Bitcoin will bring more women with Bitcoin, if you understand what I mean. Yeah, like, yeah, like pretty more much. People talk, more people talking about that and more people. That's why I'm really passionate about uh, bringing everyone to, to, to the small stage that I created here in the podcast. Uh, I'm famous for bringing people on that haven't been on a podcast before, like 10 or 15% of my podcast guests are completely unknown. Some of them didn't even had a social media account before. Oh, really? Uh, they were completely, completely no names in the digital realm. How uh, nice for them. And... You ruined it. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was okay by seeing them do the Bitcoin space. <laughs> but yeah, that's an interesting way to look at it. But yeah, that that's uh that's what I, I try to do. And and uh, I think the more different people and perspectives we get to Bitcoin, the more different people and perspectives do we get into Bitcoin. So uh, we, we this role model thing is, is 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 real. And it's not only like women and 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 and, and men, it's just like Oh yeah, like there's a science teacher, and when he talks about Bitcoin, uh, that probably resonates with other science teachers. Like there, there, there's those small things, and we cannot just have Michael Saylor doing all the Bitcoin podcasts. We need all of them. I still ha had him on because it, he's Michael Saylor, but uh, we, we we need so many different uh, voices, and I think that's 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 where we get into that. It's interesting thing. that you had him on because I, I, to be honest, I get a little bit sick of seeing Michael Saylor everywhere and I'm, I'm not nearly as into him as everyone else is. But there's one question that I would like to ask him that I don't think anyone has asked him, which is why are you buying up all the Bitcoin? So he's buying up all the Bitcoin. As I understand, it's all being custodied in uh, Coinbase. And so you've got this giant honeypot of a load of Bitcoin that he's borrowing money like it's going out of fashion to buy. And I'm like, why is he doing that? Wouldn't he want other people to be buying the Bitcoin? Or is he planning on buying it and then giving it to people that don't have it? I, don't, I just, I'm super confused about what his motivations are. I don't know whether you yeah. had any inkling of that when you spoke to him. I, I don't know. I, I, I feel like he might, uh, like that's, I have no knowledge about that. I didn't speak with him about that, but <laughs> I think uh, he might give away a big portion of his Bitcoin when he dies or something like that, because he, he cannot spend it all. Like he has so many Bitcoin. And there's also like a difference between Michael's strategy having Bitcoin and him having Bitcoin, mm -hmm. uh, because we don't know where his personal Bitcoin are, but we know where uh, Michael's strategy holds the Bitcoin. Like Michael's strategy holds like 210 or 220,000 Bitcoin. I, I I mm -hmm. lost, <laughs> lost tra keeping track of, of the huge number of Bitcoin they have. And then there's yeah. also him personally. And we know that he has at least 17,000 Bitcoin personally. That's a huge number uh, without even micro strategy. Um, so 
where he has them, maybe he ha has self-custody, maybe he has some multi-signature. I don't know what, what he personally does, probably uh, not that different to what he does with the company. Um, but uh, I, I think if you have that huge amount of Bitcoin, either you give it to your family or you might give it away, or he does the ultimate thing that a lot of people say, like, just... <laughs> transfer it to Time a wallet, it. Uh, throw away the key and then give it to humanity back and burn the Bitcoin forever. Like that would be also something interesting. Yeah, it's interesting, actually, because I, I made a comment on somebody's thread the other day and nobody responded to it. But I, I was like, what happens when all the Bitcoin is lost? Because the Bitcoin obviously can be lost and we've already lost a ton of it. So what happens when all of it gets lost? That's an interesting I mean, question. Right. At some point that's going to happen. I mean, it has to, even if it's like a hundred years, 200 years, at some point it's going to trend towards a hundred percent loss. I mean, I don't know if we ever get to the point where everything gets lost. It's like one I mean, sat still, left. Uh, if, <laughs> I mean, because it's, uh, because it's, uh, digital, you, you can make a soft fork and you can make uh, one sats divided by a, a number of reasons. You can actually make the whole thing work with just one sat and just divide it in so many different uh, smaller units that you can actually make the whole uh, system work with just like a few units because 21 million Bitcoin is just, an, just a random number. It could very mm -hmm. well be also 50 million or just 1 million or like 15 million. It, it, it doesn't really matter. It just you have to divide it that everyone can use a little bit. Uh, so, but it's an interesting question. What happens if everything gets lost? Like literally the last sat getting lost. I don't like, I never thought about that. Like that's really interesting. There's never, <laughs> nobody ever brought that up. Uh, <laughs> but what, what's your thoughts around that? Do, do you think uh, Bitcoin oh. will get to a point uh, to, if in a thousand, uh, hundred thousand years where every sat is getting lost? I mean, it kind of has to. I think logic would dictate that it has to. Like, it would have to trend towards zero because we've lost how many Bitcoin already? Is it six million, five million, something like that? There was some yeah, like I, big yeah, my, number. My right? number is always six million that I use, but uh, it's ob obviously there are no no real official number. Mm. But my estimation is around four to six millions. Yeah, I mean, so if there's only twenty one million and it's only taken us what fifteen years to lose that many, I mean, if we keep losing them at the same rate which actually could very likely happen as you get mass adoption, you get more and more people making mistakes. And then next thing you know, um, I don't know. I don't know what would happen. But, I don't but know. Also, I mean, <laughs> so, sorry, but, uh, I, but I think we're also getting better in custodying them because I feel like uh, a lot of Bitcoin got lost because people didn't knew or they, they just like mended, uh, mined a lot of them in 2010, 11, 12 they left it on a laptop and there were like 100,000 Bitcoin on there because they let the, the, the laptop run mm. for a few weeks or months even. And then they <laughs> threw out the, the laptop because they didn't even think about Bitcoin. And then like years later, oh shit, I threw, <laughs> threw out a few millions or few billions uh, worth of, uh, of Bitcoin. And I think we are way more aware. And I just think of, my custody thinking like from from the first time i ever thought about custody i've actually i'm i'm i think one of the few people that custodied their bitcoin in self custody on day one like the first time they bought bitcoin i directly went to to a ledger back then in four years later uh, four years ago but i yeah, think no, we're I just getting way better <laughs> I think I studied Bitcoin for about six months to a year before I actually bought any as well. I just was, oh, wow. uh, yeah, I just kind of wanted to understand it. I was really more enthralled with the philosophy of it than, than I think a lot of people think of it like a get rich quick thing. And I'll be honest, I wasn't terribly interested in that. I was just kind of like, meh, you know, I don't think of like, oh, I'd retire. Cause like, why would you retire? I mean, I really like working. So why would I, why would I ever stop? Um, so yeah, I don't know. I was just really fascinated by it. Um, I, I just kind of love the idea that it was something that could completely, I, I came from a background in financial markets. So I spent 20 years in financial markets and I could see that there was something not right with the system, but when you're in it, it's quite hard to identify what that is. Um, and I tell people a story a lot as well of how, like um, I started my career at Bloomberg in finance. So I started in events organizing and then I moved to finance. Um, and 
we they they invest a lot in training you there so we did lots of like training sessions lots of economics finance training that kind of thing and i remember asking one of the economics tutors she was we were doing bond math and she was explaining to us how to like price bonds and i asked her about inflation and i said well why do we even have inflation like what what's the mechanism that creates it and i just remember she was scribbling on the whiteboard and she turned around and she went well, because people keep asking for higher wages, obviously, like that's the reason why. <laughs> and this was somebody who had like, a, I think, an uh, like a, a master's in economics, not just a, a, a degree. And um, and I was kind of like, okay, that doesn't really make sense because, you know, you get more experience in your job and therefore you're worth more as an employee. So therefore you have a right to charge more. Older generations are retiring, so they're coming out of the workforce. So you're basically replacing them as they retire, as you move up the corporate ladder. And then you've got junior people coming in who are new, who are inexperienced. So obviously they get paid less because they bring less to the table. So that explanation didn't really make sense, but I never was able to get from anybody in financial markets a proper explanation as to why that was happening. And it was actually a Jordan Peterson interview that he did with Four Bitcoiners that I listened to. So I'd left, I was working at an investment bank and I left and I had a couple of months on gardening leave where I basically could just do what I wanted before moving. I live in Canada, so I was moving from New York to Canada. And um, and I was, you know, thinking, what shall I do next? And I had a bunch of colleagues that had gone to crypto companies. So it was actually weirdly my mum who orange pilled me. So I, I said to her, you know, I'm like thinking I want to do something different with my life. I don't want to work in finance. And you know, crypto looks quite interesting. And she said, oh, you know, she's really into Jordan Peterson. She's like, oh, Jordan Peterson's just interviewed these Bitcoiners. You should listen to his thing. And she hadn't listened to it. But I was like, that's weird. Like, isn't he a clinical psychologist? Like, why is he interviewing Bitcoiners? Um, and it was actually a Bitcoin book club that he had a conversation with. And they were studying Jordan Peterson's book, uh, Maps of Meaning, which is kind of like a book about I don't know how you describe it, really. I've actually just finished it three years later. It's very heavy going. Um, but they were basically listening to the, 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 or studying the book for their book club and asked Jordan Peterson if he would come and do a, a talk with them. And it was 90 minutes long and it just blew my mind. I just listened to it and I was like, oh my God, like everything I've believed for 20 years and this whole ecosystem I've been in is just a complete sham. And my mum calls me up the next day and she's like, oh, it, have you listened to it yet? Is it worth listening to? And I was just like, it's completely changed my life. And she's like, what? <laughs> I was just like, I've been in finance for 20 years and I understood nothing about money. Like I've learned more in those 90 minutes than I did in 20 years in finance. And it was just mind blowing. So at that point, I was just like down the rabbit hole. And then I read Jeff Booth's book. I listened to actually his podcast series on on what is money. And then I've read his book, uh, The Price of Tomorrow. And I was just completely blown away. I was like, oh my God, this is like the entire world I live in is not what I thought it was. And I'm sure you can empathize with that because then you just go down this crazy rabbit hole. So I was really kind of busy studying it and trying to understand it and figure out what it was. Um, and then I went and volunteered for a Bitcoin meetup in Toronto. So at the time I was living in Toronto and I was, uh, they were like the oldest meetup in Toronto. And, you know, they kind of taught me about wallets and how seed phrases worked and things like that. So it was a big chunk of time really before I actually took the leap and thought, yeah, you know, I'll try it out. But yes, I was the same as you. I self custodied straight away. Um, you know, that's interesting uh, that you brought up the salary thing. I, I, I love that, uh, that that how you got orange built. But but uh, do do you think we? <laughs> I I take now a little bit of my salary, basically of my sponsorships in in Bitcoin. So I'm prepared of getting less and less satoshis for a, a higher value of actual wor uh, work. Do are, are we ready for decreasing salaries? Like are are we ready for uh, each year actually decreasing our salaries because the purchasing power goes up and if we don't keep up with like the purchasing power increase of Bitcoin, that, that could be an, an interesting mm. thing in a Bitcoin world. I mean, I would argue, does a salary need to decrease? I mean, the because you, you're measuring it in... Well, so I guess it depends what terms you're measuring in it in. But if you if your fiat salary stays the same, then... <laughs> Hang on a second. If your fiat salary stays the same, 
Well, it depends if you buy Bitcoin with it or not, right? So if you if you keep getting paid in fiat, then your purchasing power will keep to de keep decreasing. But it's doing that anyway. So, I mean, I th I one thing that I've really struggled with a little bit, and I still think about this a lot, and I haven't really been able to kind of wrap my head around it is as as the purchasing power of money decreases or the value of money decreases you work harder so there's an incentive to do more and contribute more to society to the economy and you know we all hate our lives because we have to work too many hours and everybody's tired and you know overworked but everybody's producing so I keep asking myself what happens when the value of your savings keeps going up without you having to do anything. Your purchasing power increases. What's the incentive to actually produce at that point? You know, so for example, like I might produce food because I want to eat, but you know, what's my incentive to produce food for other people when I'm getting paid less and less and less for that same amount of labor? I think something very beautiful uh, will happen where people don't have to work, but actually find something you really want to do and like maybe i'm naive and maybe i'm just a dreamer but <laughs> uh but it, it, even in that case i think that um people for example i get bored if i don't have anything to do like i sometimes take breaks they break some maximum like half a day or day um if 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 i go on holidays maybe it's like two days but then on the second day i have to work something um so I think we are inclined to uh, contribute something to community and something to uh, society. And we want to do something like just laying around on the beach and just laying around in front of the TV. It's depressing after some time, at least for me, I, that's, that's just my uh, experience. And there might be a small group of people that actually want to do that. And they find it, they can just scroll on their phone and watch TV all day, uh, all day long. Uh, they, they, that's, that's fine for me. They, they, they can watch the whole entire uh, podcast of, of, of mine all day long. <laughs> uh, at least they should watch something good, <laughs> but, but, uh, I think, um, People producing something will always be there because people want to be maybe meaningful. They want they, they want more in, in than money in life. Of course, money is a big driver. So mm -hmm. maybe we come to a point where people actually think of like, oh, what do I actually want to do in life? What what do I want to create in life? And the basic things probably will be way more taken care of because of robotics, AI, mm -hmm. and all those things. And then we can think of more the bigger problems and more creative problems like, oh, how do we uh, bring humans to other planets and uh, what 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 uh, other things and creative things should we do? So that, that's my positive f way of thinking. Um, I don't know if, if it, it actually, I think it's actually in, incentivizes a good productivity and efficient productivity and mm. kind of cuts out that, oh, I go to a job and be there eight hours just to be there mm -hmm. eight hours. So there's this, we have a lot of zombie companies, uh, I call them, but I don't know what's, what's your take on this. Oh, yeah. I mean, I was going to ask you like who does the street sweeping, but I guess in your, in your vision of the future, it would be robots, which actually makes sense because I don't hoover the house. We have a robot that does it. So I'm already, <laughs> I'm already part way there. <laughs> like I literally could not live without my iRobot. It's the best thing ever invented. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think the free market will take actually care of that because if we didn't figure out um, the the that robots can sweep the streets, mm. then we are not at a wealth status where everyone is so wealthy that they can just be creative and do whatever they want to do. But if mm. we are at a status where everyone is as wealthy, then this means we are already at the stage where we don't have to sweep the the, the, the streets and, mm. and, and do those things because we we figured out a way to do it more efficiently so i i think as long as we have um, a, a free market as long as we can figure out a way uh, uh to to keep competition uh, alive uh, th then we will be we'll be fine in, in the long run so that's that's like uh, that's why I, I love bitcoin so much because it en enables a free market and doesn't manipulate the, the economy uh, too much yeah it's funny because in some ways i wonder if we're living in what like future generations will consider the dark ages like they'll look back at us and be like oh those poor people you know they had such miserable lives 
<laughs> There's no meaning. So, so, you're, so you're, you're saying so you're saying we're living in a dark, dark ages and a bright orange future is just coming around. I mean, I think so. I think we are living in a bit of a dark age and I think we kind of think that we're not. We're sort of deluded in thinking that we we kind of, I don't know. I mean, it's funny. I mean, I do love a conspiracy theory and I do like going down some of these crazy rabbit holes, but it is interesting sometimes when you look at things and you actually start to question things and you're like, oh, like, are these things what I really believe them to be? I mean, I don't know if you've gone down the pyramid rabbit hole. I was chatting to Tom Nelson about this on my podcast the other day. Um, he's the guy that produced Climate, the movie. He's he, If you haven't had him on, by the way, you should. He's great. He's so interesting. Um, but he basically started researching climate stuff and realized it was nonsense. And then he produced this movie with with a couple of other people about like the facts around climate change. But I asked him because he's, he goes down all these rabbit holes and I said to him, have you gone down the Egyptian pyramid rabbit hole? And he said, no, I haven't. So I was like, I'm going to send you a load of stuff. Um, but it's interesting because the pyramids, have, they've never found any tombs in the pyramids. So they've never found any mummies, any tombs or any kind of um, uh, trinkets and stuff like they have in the valley. Is it the Valley of the Kings? Um, and so there's a theory that those pyramids are actually energy producing mechanisms. So they harness energy from the atmosphere. Um, and I've seen lots of like posts about this and watched a few like YouTube videos and things like that. But you do have to wonder, um, because I remember reading when I was very young, a book by Graham Hancock, and he was talking about the pyramids and saying about how, you know, they say that they're like, I don't know, whatever it is, four or 5,000 years old, but actually they've got water damage on their base, which could only have been created um, during the last ice age. So what, what geologists say is, well, they can't, they have to be older than the last ice age. But what Egyptologists will tell you is that they're like four or 5,000 years old, which they couldn't be. Um, like it wouldn't have been possible for that water damage to be created. So the question then is, why would you go and build something like that? And what was its purpose? Um, and I always find it somewhat ridiculous when people talk about, um, sorry, we're going way off the topic of Bitcoin here, but I find it ridiculous when people talk about things like Stonehenge and they'll go, oh, that was a religious site where people worshipped. And I'm like, why do you always assume that every structure that's ancient has a religious connotation? It'd be like, I don't know, future people turning up at, I don't know, the Hoover Dam and saying, yeah, that was a place of worship where people worshipped water or, you know, I don't know, even going into a modern art gallery and being like, oh, this was a place of worship. No, it wasn't. You know, we went to look at like cute things. You know, so I just I feel like we often have this kind of silly notion of history where we just imagine that people are these like super religious, ritualistic people and that everything they built is is somehow has a religious purpose and nothing else. So, yeah, I think we've forgotten a lot of our history and, and maybe don't really know why those structures are there or what they're for. I also think we uh, think of ourselves as uh, way more advanced uh, than than the past, even though we might not be that much more advanced than the past, depending on, 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 on how far you're going. By the way, I scheduled already with Tom Nelson, so he will be on uh, quite soon. Uh, not, not that uh, long. I think like, I don't know the exact date, but like, I think a one, around one month he, he will be on. Uh, oh, okay. Like what, what is the conspiracy around pyramids? I never heard of that. Well, the conspiracy is that they're not actually tombs of pharaohs that they were just appropriated by the Pharaoh generation, if you like, um, you know, during that time, but they weren't actually built by, by those dynasties. So that's, that's kind of the conspiracy theory about them that they're, um, you know, they have a t completely different purpose and it's not related to that particular dynastic people that we know. Mm, interesting. <laughs> Never heard it's a that. good rabbit hole. <laughs> I, I I will I will see if uh, if I can get down there. <laughs> what do you think is the the main barrier for for Bitcoin to overcome to come to that Bitcoin world to come to like a mass adoption? You said before like the UI is a, is a big one. Uh, do you see anything else that you like? Uh, that's a main barrier that we have to overcoming Bitcoin. Gosh, I think far too few people realize why they need it 
at this stage. And I'm trying to think really why it resonated with me so much. I, I think people don't realize how bad the monetary system is. So I think for most people, they kind of see the very superficial stuff, like I go to the grocery store and it costs more. And then they listen to a politician and the politician will talk about, well, yeah, it's because of COVID or it's because of like the war in Ukraine. Like there'll be a million and one excuses for it. Um, and so they don't really delve into it and they just accept that explanation at face value much like I did about inflation 20 years ago I was like oh okay that's the reason why it doesn't make sense but okay you're the expert I guess if you say so I'll, I'll take it at face value and so I don't think they realize um, the kind of cataclysmic monetary train crash that's about to happen um, I think they just don't get it they don't understand what's happening and, and what's about to kind of fall apart so you know, they don't understand. I mean, for example, even people in finance, to, to give you an example, during the lockdowns, I remember chatting to a colleague and we were talking about the fact that the US government was printing so much money to fund lockdowns. You know, at the time I'm working in a bank and so we're sort of talking about it amongst ourselves and going, you know, what impact would that have? And, you know, one of my colleagues that worked in research, so bear in mind, she's got like an actual research, qualified, like a CPA qualification or whatever, Um what's it called that you do for research? Oh my God, it's been such a long time now, I've forgotten. Um, there's like a formal qualification that you have to do to actually be like a, a portfolio manager and a researcher. And she was saying to me, yeah, you know, but I was attending a session the other day and they were saying, I was listening to an economist and he was saying, the US government can print all the money it needs. So it doesn't really matter. Like we're never going to go bankrupt because we can just print money and and pay ourselves off and with a reserve currency. So it's fine. Um, and that was kind of it. And I was like, hmm, okay, that's interesting. And you don't think about what the consequences will be because nobody explains to you, well, yeah, but if you keep printing all this money, the system's going to be awash with money and everything's going to go up in price. You just don't think about those consequences because it's on such a big scale. It's like a geopolitical scale. And so my the unfortunate thing is I think a lot of people will – discover that they need to adopt Bitcoin and will get mass adoption when it's pretty late for everybody. And I don't mean late as in, I think you can get on the Bitcoin bandwagon at any point. And it's, you know, as Michael Saylor says, it's going up forever, Laura. <laughs> you know, so I, I, I don't think that, um, you know, I think you will benefit regardless of when you become a Bitcoiner. But I don't think people realize at this stage how critical it is for them to just hold a little bit like they don't have to hold a lot. It can be a hundred dollars, um, but how critical that actually is to, you know, buttress themselves against against the economic crash that's coming. So unfortunately, I think mass adoption will probably happen out of necessity rather than out of uh, desire or some ideological reason. If you watch my podcast already for more than two times, you know how extremely passionate I am about self-custody. And the first very, very, very important step to self-custody is always getting yourself a hardware wallet. And I have one for you here. This is the Bitcoin only edition from the Bitbox, my favorite single signature hardware wallet on the market. Another really important piece of self-custody if you have a hardware wallet is the backup of the seed phrase. And Bitbox made the perfect solution to back up your seed phrase. They made a reusable steel wallet. Check out that beauty. It's durable it's extremely heavy. If I put it on the desk, I seriously fear for my own table. It's so, so heavy and durable. I love it. This is where my seed phrase is secure. Go to bitbox.swiss slash Robin to get your bitbox. And if you use code Robin, you even get 5% off of your complete order. And the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual. You have to have the most secure self-custody setup. You have to secure your own devices. You have to protect your privacy. You have to set up an inheritance plan. And depending on where you live, you even want to have a plan B, a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really, really wrong. And through all those steps, the Bitcoin way is guiding you through step 
by step. And if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made a and perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin only. And Coin Vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing Genesis edition of their watch collections. You have the date of the first ever mined Bitcoin block in there. And of course, also the block height and which epoch we are currently in. I love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece. And make sure to check out those amazing Coin Vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions. I love those watches so, so much. Yeah, it's, it's, it comes down to the, that the pain is not big enough and they don't see that the train is crashing and they could now get out, but uh, they're like, ah, let's, let's, let's sit in the train chair and let's, 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 let's ride along. So I also like to ask actually um, normies that don't get it or they, they are not in the Bitcoin rabbit hole yet. They're like, when I ask them, okay, the, the governments have so much debt, uh, where is the money coming from? Uh, what do you think this this will do? What do you think of inflation? Like I, I usually tackle the the Bitcoin education before with uh, some general financial education and even like financial people, as you said, they they, <laughs> they are into that deep yeah. and they're like, yeah, the uh, US can never default because they can always print money because they're the re reserve currency. But what if they stop being the reserve currency? What if Bitcoin all of a sudden mm. is the reserve currency? Then, then they still can print money. <laughs> Nobody will accept it for any uh, real world good. So, uh, it's there's a lot a big blind spot for 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 the world. I f I feel like that. Yeah, and I think all of us. I mean, we have sort of you know short shortish lives, right? So we don't really appreciate like what's come before. And many people don't really study history, and much of history I've also realised is bullshit. Like it's it's you get taught this very kind of narrow. Sorry, am I allowed to swear? <laughs> Cut that bit out. But um, it's uh, you know it's taught like in a very narrow way. So you learn the sort of prescribed things that you're allowed to talk about. There's like an Overton window of like, this is where the discussion is allowed to happen. And you can argue within this window, but you're not allowed to argue outside of it. And so I think that's part of the problem is people don't really see see the kind of historical thing where every single fiat currency has eventually collapsed. Every single one. Like there's not one in the history. I think the British pound is the longest running one. Um, and that's trending to collapse anyway with uh, a lot of help from the British government. Um, so I think that's part of the reason. And the other thing as well is I think there is actually a concerted effort to mislead people. I mean, you were saying about talking to normies about things that they can relate to, like inflation and, you know, that kind of stuff. And I'm kind of like, sure. But for example, you know, I have people, neighbors that talk to me about how everything's getting so expensive and it's the boomers fault because they're all sitting on these piles of wealth and these big houses that they refuse to sell. And that's the reason why housing is becoming so expensive for everyone else, because the boomers are sitting in their houses and not selling them. And I'm like, okay, like the houses are not becoming more valuable. The money is becoming less valuable. So the boomers are not sitting on an expensive house. If they sell that house, they can only buy the same house, like same value of house or same kind of house with that money. It's not like they suddenly can afford something better than what they had. And why should somebody who's lived in their house for 40, 50 years sell it? Because, you know, I don't know the, the, what you call it, the property taxes go up so high that they don't actually have the cash flow to pay for it. I mean, it's just so fundamentally moral. And I hear this everywhere. And I even saw quite a well known Bitcoin, or I forget who it was the other day, wrote a whole thread about, you know, basically bashing boomers for sitting on piles of cash and being lazy and enjoying life. And I'm like, well, these are people that kind of were born during the war or lived during the war. You know, they had a really hard time. They didn't have nice things. And now they've kind of worked and saved all their life. I think it's kind of okay if they want to go on a cruise every now and then and live in their nice house that they've spent years, 
you know, maintaining and decorating and everything. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of this stuff you get told these narratives that are not true. And if you don't know how these things work, you just accept them at face value. And it's also interesting because I can imagine Bitcoin as being one day at that very position where because they saved so early in Bitcoin uh, and they actually cared for their Bitcoin and they had it in proper self-custody, didn't lose anything uh, because they could then actually be the, those boomers who have a lot of Bitcoin and just like live off like 1% of their stack every year and can live basically forever uh, for free. Um, they, they they could be the same. So like... Interesting. Do, do you see um, Bitcoin kind of the, the 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 new real estate, the new uh, opportunity as, as it was before for real estate? Not really, because I think with real estate, it was about making money and the yield is coming from somewhere, if that makes sense. So, you know, the <laughs> it's like, where's the yield coming from? I mean, you know, the yield yeah. is basically coming from, you know, the, the printing of the money. So you're sitting on an asset, you can then rent out the asset, you can sell it for more money later on. And, you know, that you're, you're basically a cantillionaire, essentially. Um, whereas with Bitcoin, I don't think it's the same structure. So I think when people, gosh, I mean, I guess if people become extremely wealthy through Bitcoin, I mean, it's not because they're necessarily taking anything away from anyone else. Although actually you could argue that it is it is due to the fact that the money is being devalued the whole time. So the Bitcoin becomes more valuable, but it's not a utility in the way that a house is a utility. And I think that's that's my issue morally with real estate and profiting of real estate is that, you know, it's a utility. You need a house to live in. So if that becomes um, too expensive for you to buy, there's a there's a moral issue there. If Bitcoin becomes too expensive for you to buy, oh, well, like you might not be a billionaire, but you're still probably going to be able to buy food and, and have a house and live and whatever. You know, it's not it's not kind of taking anything away from from people in that sense of something that's a utility. So, yeah, I think it's a very different thing. Gosh, it's really hard to it's really hard to define Bitcoin when you start trying to define it. You can go down 100 different rabbit holes. I mean, what is it? I mean, I think of it as being money, I guess, primarily. Um, I think of it as being a commodity. So it's something that you store. It has value, but I also think of it as being a network. I often think of Bitcoin as being this thing that, you know, we can create a historical record of what will happen. I think I was talking to Tom about this as well. And I was saying, you know, we hear so much now about history being rewritten and things on the internet being deleted and history kind of being scrubbed. And that's happened throughout history. I mean, people have burnt books for as long as books have existed, and I look at Bitcoin and I think, I know this is a bit controversial with the whole ordinal stuff and, you know, creating blockchain bloat, but I do look at it as a time chain. It's somewhere where you can record history in a way that it can't ever be erased. And I think that is actually one of the more fascinating use cases is actually being able to store knowledge in there such that we can pass that down. And, you know, maybe in 20,000 years, people don't have to wonder about the pyramids. They'll have a record where they can go back and see exactly what it was and who did what. Don't yeah, trust and verify. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's a really interesting thing. I, I, I had, oh gosh, I forgot his name. Uh, the guy who did in uh, Guatemala, I think it was the election uh, on Bitcoin, the blockchain. And he tries oh, to do yeah. it also in, in, in other countries. I forgot his name right now, but it's, it's really interesting. I mean, you have the always the origin problem, the Oracle problem where like, okay, who puts the data on the blockchain, who puts the, the things on, on Bitcoin? But yeah, of course, once it's there, you can verify that the, uh, that the document was there uh, on that time. And I think the, the concept of time chain is a really underestimated one because all mm -hmm. of a sudden we can actually pinpoint uh, something. And I, weird personal example of that, uh, I made pottery with my girlfriend where we like uh, painted the pottery and, and stuff like that. Not going too deep in, into why and everything like that. But basically um, she went ahead and she actually uh, put the date in there, like 11th of September, like all, all those things. Uh, and I just wrote the block, block, block height in there. <laughs> because I was like, the block height is uh, the best way to see when it actually was. There is the time in there, the date in there, the time zone. 
Because if you write that, you don't know which time zone that was in, uh, mm -hmm. if you just write the date. Uh, and it's, it, it is to, to um, uh, 10 or 15 or like, it's, it's not, you can really see like what was that time frame in like maybe the time frame was five minutes or 10 minutes or 50 minutes because the block could be longer. Like it could even be like one hour long, that block time of that. But it is very specific to a certain time uh, and you just have to write six numbers and then you're like, oh, there you go. You know where it is. And uh, that's a that's an amazing, uh, amazing way to do that. So I just brought that example up because it was... Think, I was thinking I, I think that's cute when people have a baby and they put like block height, born block height. And I'm like, oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I even saw like marriage rings where they on the back they wrote the block height. Yes, very because nice. Because sometimes, sometimes they write uh, on on the back the the start starting of like when when the marriage actually was, uh, and uh, it's it's kind of if you really want to have all the information on there, the block height is probably the the most minimalistic way to get it on there because <laughs> time zone and everything like that, putting on there that's that's a major thing. Yeah. There's another conspiracy theory that we we don't actually know what time we're living in, that some of our history has been erased and the dark ages, the so-called dark ages, were not the dark ages. And actually, like, we don't know even know what year we're in right now, which is kind of interesting because I'm like, yeah, it's funny, isn't it? I mean, like, I, I quite like holding traditions, like things like making a big deal about celebrating Christmas and things like that. And my husband will say things like, oh, yeah, but it's just a, a random day you know, in space time, like you're just randomly selecting it for no particular reason. And it's like, when you go, oh, a year has passed, what's a year? It's just some subjective, you know, kind of time frame that we have. And I suppose it follows the seasons, but you know, it is subjective. And you kind of think, yeah, it is. And how do we even know what the actual dates are? We, we don't really, I don't know. I mean, if you go back far enough, you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and everything is, uh, human made, like the, all the systems at some point, someone thought about it and just like defined it. It's not like, uh, nature was like, oh, like, yeah, the days and, and, and years. Of course, there's like, we, we try to put that whole thing in like to the seasons on the day of the, of the, of the time and, and like of the time of the day and all those things. Like it, it, it makes kind of sense. Uh, but, uh, yeah, we, we could also divide the day in like 60 pieces and not 24 pieces. Like there, there could be other <coughs> pieces, but I, I'm not too deep in that topic. But yeah, I think it's it's very random uh, to put a lot of meaning to like one specific day because it's just a, not a random day. Yeah, and you've got like the Mayan calendar, you've got the Gregorian calendar, like New Year's is celebrated differently in Asian countries versus Western countries. I mean, none of it's the same. It's all very subjective. So you're right. If you had a block height, we can all agree that this thing happened in a specific moment in time. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, what's your opinion on the on the Lightning Network? How important do you think uh, that uh, second layer uh, is for, for Bitcoin? I think it's unbelievably important. Um, I get really annoyed when people say that Bitcoin doesn't scale because I know the Lightning Network has some issues, but it does scale and people are using it every day to buy everything from coffee to books to holidays to everything. So it's already a payment system um, and it's certainly much more effective than like the fiat system. So I don't know if you know Sinota. Um, they're a company that's based out the US, but they basically have created this system where you can pay your electricity bill with through the lightning network at the point of usage so you put the you put it behind the meter basically so that every time you're using electricity you're paying for it immediately and energy companies love this because they don't have to wait 3 months to get paid which means you're not a risky customer to them which means in theory that can start allow them to start lowering the rates that they charge um but it's incredible when you think about it because you have this like real time payment system. And one of the co-founders came and did. So I ran a I ran a female founder training program last year, which was basically to teach women who were running businesses about how to incorporate Bitcoin. And Lisa, who is one of the co-founders of Sinota, came and did a presentation on the payment system. So she came and talked about what Sinota was doing, but she prefaced it with a whole kind of backstory of how the global payment networks work. And she's got a lot of expertise in this area. And I think most people don't know how payments work. I mean, it's insane. They're so complicated. It's ridiculous. Like the SWIFT system is unbelievably inefficient. Now you've got situations where Russia's obviously come off of SWIFT because they got kicked off, um, you know, when they, after they invaded Ukraine. 
And so all of these systems are just not functional. And countries are starting to say, well, we don't want to use them. Like the BRICS countries are saying, well, actually, we're going to establish our own reserve currency, like a BRICS currency, and we're going to have our own payments network because we don't want to deal with this kind of US, you know, uh, kind of bully, bully sort of state that wants to control, you know, our access to the monetary system. So I think there's a shift anyway away from the current payment networks, which don't really work very well at all and are centrally controlled um, and become very political to a system that is completely apolitical that anybody can join, where anybody can transact. So I think that the Lightning Network is going to be really important unless it gets replaced by something better, um, which is possible. But I think for what we have now, it's the most effective system for doing payments. Um, and then there's the whole use case as well, obviously, about just like content creation. Um, so I use Substack to run my community and I subscribe to lots of Substack writers, but it's annoying when you have to pay a subscription to somebody's entire kind of uh, content when maybe you read one article that they put out a month. But if they adopted the Lightning Network, which I strongly if Substack are listening, they should adopt it. Um you know, you could literally just pay at the point of reading. So you just go, you open an article. If you want to read it, you just click a button, you make a lightning payment, you get to read it. Same thing with consuming any media. You know, if you want to put stuff on YouTube, like a movie, and you want people to pay for it, you don't have to go through all the faff of putting in your credit card, your name, your address. Now all that stuff's on a database and it's a honeypot for someone to steal and, you know, appropriate your identity. No, you just do a lightning payment, bam, done. You pay for that one piece of content and it's seamless. And to anyone who's used the Lightning Network, it's exponentially easier than using a credit card, like exponentially easier, much quicker, much more efficient, instant. Um, so, yeah, I think it's incredible. Kudos to to the people who invented it. <laughs> they did a great job. Um, do you think it could, uh, as you said, like disrupt the, the subscription model because we can all of a sudden pay on the minute or on the second that we actually consume the things? God, I hope so. Yeah, I really hope so. I mean, I think we're early because a lot of the technology is hard to integrate. So I don't know if you know Justin, um, what's his name? Justin Hilton, who is the founder of ShockNet. So he went through the Wolf Accelerator program and he's basically built like a YouTube, but uh, a kind of lightning enabled YouTube with exactly that, where it has a lightning paywall. But, you know, if you talk to him about the technicalities of running that and setting it up, we're not quite there yet in terms of having this uber seamless technology for it. But I think as we slowly get there, it's going to become more and more of a thing because it also forces content creators to, you know, really create good content. You can't just, you know, write a couple of good articles a month and then have the rest of the stuff be rubbish and then expect people to pay for the whole thing. So, you know, we've gone so much to a subscription model with software. And it's a pain because do you remember the days, I don't know if you're old enough to remember, but you'd get a little disc and you'd come home and you'd put it in your computer. <laughs> you'd actually own the damn software. And now it's like you have to rent it, which is really annoying. And it gets upgraded all the time and you don't like the upgrade. You want the old version. So, you know, I just think if we're going to be in that subscription model, then it should be on a usage basis and not on a on a kind of a download uh, basis. I, oh, sorry, I'm, subscription I, basis. I, I, I'm kind of old enough, but it was like beginning of the days. It was very short term here. So I had some CDs and DVDs. So like <laughs> I, I, I get that world, but uh, I'm I'm not long in there. It's also like one of the things like I, I like Canva and I love Riverside. I love all those great online tools. But it's annoying if they change the whole UX every two, three months. And I'm like, wh where is that one feature that I really need for the podcast? Where is this one feature where I really need for that picture to look like uh, in the family uh, that it lo always looks like? On the one side, it's great that they innovate, great that they bring new features, but then they hide things or it's different. Like with Riverside, I struggle a lot because they uh, do a lot of innovating and they're doing a lot of great stuff and fancy things which uh, helps me also a lot. But then I have to write them like, how can I do that now? <laughs> like I did this all the time with that one button. Now that button is not there anymore. Is there another way to do the same thing? Because otherwise I can have to completely change my workflow. So like uh, it's it's great and, and it's good and bad at the same time. But I like the idea of you 
paying for something when I'm using it. So that's, uh, I'm, 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 I really love that, that idea. And you brought it up and even Makatonsky uh, also brought it up to me, uh, who was on the, on the podcast. Really, really cool. And one last yeah. question. Um, mm. oh, sorry, you wanted to say something about it? No, I was just going to say, if you combine that with Nostra then, I mean, which, which, you know, zaps, I mean, now you just have like this perfect, perfect kind of platform of censorship free, mostly censorship, censorship free, you know, communication and the ability to just pay people directly. I think the only thing we've got now really is just, I'll be honest, just the parasitic regulatory and government structure that sits above it because it's like, oh, you've got to file taxes or you've got to pay capital gains. You've got to, do I mean, all of that stuff is just, it has become a complete, uh, it just a complete barrier to innovation and to progress. And I think we just need to get rid of all of that. <laughs> You know, get rid of all of it. Trade should just be free. Taxation shouldn't happen. If you're doing business with people, you shouldn't be taxed on it. I'm happy to pay for things like roads and, you know, sewer networks and things like that. But government should be service providers and the tax should be literally limited to what services are you providing for me and how well are you doing it? Like when's the trash getting collected? Are the streets being swept? You know, all, all of that kind of stuff. Fine. Everything else that falls outside of it, it just needs to be taken off of their remit. It's um, uh, And if we have to legislate to say they cannot ever do it, then that's what we'll have to do. But it's just, yeah, I mean, it's ridiculous. Do you think that Bitcoin uh, will bring that future, bring uh, yes. that service-based government? <laughs> It's either that or we're living in a digital panopticon slavery. I think we're at a crossroads now where it's like, you know, which way? <laughs> um, but yes, I mean, I think that absolutely would. I just think, I think what I notice generally, I mean, not to go too into politics, but I just noticed that governments are becoming increasingly less relevant as a benefit. Like they're providing no benefit and they're actually causing more problems than they're, they're solving. And I just see this over my lifetime increasing exponentially. I mean, it's getting to the point where it's just like the whole bureaucratic structure is just pointless. I don't even know why these people exist. So, yeah, I think Bitcoin will take us there. That's the hope. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, that, that's the hope and the, the other way is, is cbdc's and suffering and war and and complete uh digital control uh and 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 i really hope that we we have that bitcoin world where we live in 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 peace and prosperity and and we have individual rights and we have pros uh the, the the individual and the human being is in on, on the highest front and not like the collectivist stuff uh, and the cbdc stuff uh, I, i think that's that's the That's the thing that we we have have to choose. Do, do you think it's important to get into politics as, as a Bitcoiner, or will, will that thing sort out anyways? It's a hard thing to say, really, because it depends on what level you're looking at these things. I think if you're looking at these things energetically, then giving your energy to it allows it to grow, like whatever you focus on grows. Um, so if you sort of ascribe to this kind of spiritual view of the world, then probably focusing on what's going on in politics is not ideal. Um, the only thing I would say is that you might not care about politics, but politics cares about you, you know, so it's like saying, I don't care about government. Well, you still have to pay your taxes. You know, you still get arrested if you break some law that they've invented. Unfortunately, I had to restart the podcast with Krista two times. This was now the second time we had to restart. And unfortunately, the over go to the next part was not as good as it uh, should be so i wanted to just give you that as a context so you understand what we were talking about in the next few minutes because we're talking about uh riverside breaking and all those things and also some interesting talks with jeff booth and i really wanted to let them in the podcast because i think that's kind of interesting uh and don't just cut them out so I hope this gives you context. And by the way, I also saw one thing. Um, I saw that only a third of my regular listeners, so those people who uh, listen to more than uh, just one video that come back to listen uh, again and again to a video, only a third of those people I actually subscribed. So this tells me two things. First of all, only 33% are actually subscribed to my channel who are actually enjoying the channel uh, long term. And that we could opt actually already be at 30,000 subscribers. That is amazing on YouTube. So for, first of all, thank you so much for supporting me. And if you could do me now the favor of just hitting the subscribe button, if you haven't done already, uh, that would mean the world to me. And it also really boosts the channel. So thank you so much. And now enjoy the last part with Krista.
then uh, then I will collect the free files and put it together somehow. <laughs> so <sorry. laughs> no worries. I had it with uh, I had it that actually with Jeff Booth, and this was really funny. We recorded with Jeff Booth, and he was talking about the free market, and then he used as an example Riverside. And literally, while he was talking about Riverside, Riverside was failing and uh, cutting out, <laughs> and we had to restart them. <laughs> He's so uh, amazing. I could listen to his podcast forever. It's funny because everybody keeps saying they want uh, Michael Saylor to go on Joe Rogan. And I'm like, I would so much prefer to have Jeff Booth on. I just think, it, you know, everyone's really into Michael Saylor, but he talks about things I feel like from a very economic standpoint. I feel like with Jeff Booth, he almost takes it like a level higher. You know, it's really just outside of the realm of like what we really conceive. I don't know. I just find his his um, his stuff like almost spiritual in some ways. I think uh, what Michael Saylor has going for him is that he is like, obviously he's really good in speaking and making metaphors and making comparisons to things. Like he's really good in saying the one thing by Bitcoin now in so many different ways and compared to his, like he's really good in that. But context also really matters because he's a really successful, uh, long served uh, publicly traded CEO, not no longer now because now he's only the chairman. And like, for me, it's context is really important because if, if, uh, some random guy that is just like one week or two week on Twitter, um, says like, oh, like I, I love to go shit and, and play chess on, on, on the toilet, that will probably not get a, a lot of views and a lot of excitement and a lot of interesting comments. But mm. if the same thing, uh, Joe Rogan tweets or Elon Musk tweets or like Michael Seder tweets, that gets a lot of uh, attention. And I think Michael Saylor is just like this, has this kind of pop level uh, status mm -hmm. um, where the context is him as a person plays a lot in the role. And then he also speaks really good. Uh, and even though there might be better speakers and might be better metaphors and might be better few in it, the context is so important on a, on a person uh, that people really love Michael Saylor. And I, I mean, he was, for me, also the one that orange peeled me, Michael Saylor. So for me, it was also really profound, uh, the interview of him. But I agree, like the, the context matters. And I think that's why people really want him to be on Joe Rogan. But they should both be on Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan should open his eyes and, 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 and maybe get like five Bitcoiners on. I was astounded, by the way. Did you know that, uh, uh, what's his name, Andreas Antonopoulos was on Joe Rogan years ago? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a lot of people don't know that. And and it was like years later that Joe Rogan eventually bought Bitcoin. And I'm like, how did you have this guy on your show and not like straight up? I'm just like, oh, my God. I mean, he's kind of gone off the radar now. I think Andreas Antonopoulos is just like semi-retired or just wants to be left alone and doesn't want to be a public figure anymore. But he was an amazing speaker absolutely amazing and i was just like wow it's crazy but it really goes to show because joe rogan's somebody that's very curious he's very interested in things but it just goes to show that you need like a lot of reinforcement with these things like repetition before they sink in like he only bought bitcoin i think a year ago yeah so and and, he, and, <laughs> and uh it's also interesting because he he's in a really good financial position so he's not in a position uh where he really needs bitcoin right now like he's not uh, struggling with it so he probably needs a lot more reminders of, of of that and he gets pitched so many ideas with talking with so many different people mm -hmm. uh and he cannot adopt all ideas that get uh, gets pitched to to him during out the podcast otherwise like he cannot he just cannot do that so that's that's an interesting thing with with Joe Rogan. But yeah, like that, that, that kind of ends up our, our podcast, our third, third, third try <laughs> of the podcast. Um, uh, thank you so much for, for being on. I have one question that I always ask uh, each guest uh, at the end of the podcast. What can we learn from you besides all the things that we already talked about? Oh, gosh, my God. <laughs> you should tell me this one in advance. I have to prepare. What's to learn? I'm going to say something probably a bit controversial for the maxis, but I'm like, don't don't necessarily believe or buy into Bitcoin entirely. Like, do your own research and keep questioning it because I think it holds a lot of promise and I'm definitely seeing myself as a Bitcoin maxi and I have a lot of faith in it as a technology. But there are so many unknown 
unknowns <laughs> that you just you shouldn't don't don't assume that it's the only thing that's going to save you you know don't rely on bitcoin as bitcoin's going to come and save you i think you need to also think about practical things like rowing your boat making sure you've got enough food in storage making sure you've got you know safety plans things like that um you know all the usual things that you might do as a human to keep yourself alive and progress spiritually or whatever it is that you feel that you're here to do don't think that bitcoin's necessarily going to come to save you so i think that would probably be my advice um i think a note i'd leave on is i'd, I'd encourage people maybe to consider bitcoin as the second coming so <laughs> which might slightly contradict what i've just said um but I've, I've mused about this a lot myself about whether it actually is, if we are living in a simulation, is this actually like the second coming is actually like an antivirus of code that's been injected in. So I do wonder whether Bitcoin has, I, I ascribe a lot to the theory that we're living in a simulation. So I think Bitcoin might be something that has been put into our matrix to fix a program that is going wrong. So that, that's I, I a thought I would maybe leave people with. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love i love it uh, i love it a lot um and uh it's it's really interesting i have uh, now an end routine uh the second question of the end routine the, the the really the last question of of this podcast is always the question where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest is and it's uh it, it would oh, have already the, the the answer of you from the previous question already would have fitted maybe you find something else What's the thing that you most dislike about the Bitcoin community? I don't really dislike anything about the Bitcoin community per se, but I think I was very attracted to it because of the ethics of it, of sound money and and what I saw as a more wholesome environment than traditional finance. And I think it's been disappointing to learn over the last, mostly I'd say maybe the last year or so, because I've maybe been a bit more public and interacted with people a bit more, but there's a lot of grifters. And I think that was quite a sad thing for me to realize because it's it's the public perception of it. And I've always been very anti that and felt that that wasn't really representative of people in Bitcoin. But I have come across quite a lot of people of late um, that I would say uh, would fit that grifter thing. So I'd say that's kind of I was a little bit disappointed in in seeing that in the Bitcoin community. But, you know, take the good I, with the I, bad. I guess uh, wherever there's money, there are grifters. <laughs> <laughs> I think you, we can't kind of get rid of them, but uh, yeah, really good uh, insight. Thank you so much, uh, Christopher, for, for being on, uh, for taking the time. Before I leave you, uh, before I can let you, <laughs> before I can let you go, uh, where can people find you? Where can people reach out to you and ask you questions? Um, well, so yeah, I've run a Bitcoin community for women, Access Tribe, obviously. So you can find me on uh, at Access Tribe on Twitter at access underscore tribe on uh, Instagram. And I think it's at access tribe Bitcoin on Facebook. And then if you look up on LinkedIn, it's just under the company of access tribe. Uh, I have a new YouTube channel as well, which I don't really babysit very much because I send my podcasts all out on Substack, but it, the stuff is there, the talks and the various uh, podcasts. So that's at youtube.com forward slash at access tribe. Um, and I think that's it. That's pretty much all the socials. And obviously the website, accesstribe.com. <laughs> Perfect. And thank you so much for taking the time. Also, thank you so much for everyone that is watching and listening uh, for joining us today. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye. Thank you for having me. <laughs>